Yo, yo I'm like an addict, do I gotta have it? I ain't even playing, got a really bad habit If it moves, gotta grab it Fuse like a magnet, lose, won't have it Till I'm doomed in a casket I ain't playing, got a weird mind If you work it, I would... From the 1970s when Moy was the vice president to 2002 when he finally retired, the former president had accumulated wealth unquantifiable. Unquantifiable in the sense that the investigators couldn't find and or prove everything. However, the key people in Moy's circle were collectively able to load billions of shillings. Today, we talk about family, friends, and colleagues that helped Moi plan. Jeff Kafka. Moi had eight children, nine if we include Lee. Jennifer Chemutai Kostani, born in 1953. Jonathan Toretich, a famous rally driver. John Mark, the third born. Raymond Moy, born in 1960. Moy also had twins, Philip and Doris, born in 1962. Then there was John Moy. And lastly, Gideon Moy born in 1964. Some sources say Lee Kinyajinjui, the former Nakuru governor, was Moi's son. Those sources do not, however, elaborate further. So we leave it at that. The prominent among them were his youngest. Gideon Moy and Philip Moy. They say a chip never falls far from the old block, and it was proven so by these two. Growing up, they were not too much into the family businesses. However, over time, they started showing interest in getting directly involved in running of the Moy's empire. Like the responsible heirs they were, they brought in the techniques and the personnel that were to be the masterminds in the stealing, moving, and spending the wealth. Let's face it, they are evilly educated. Have you heard Gideon Moy speaking? She, you know, the way I looked after, or I think I looked after, and the way we all looked after Mze, my people always tell me, you know, it is how you look after your parents is how your children will look after you. They are well-traveled. They can get the audience of anyone in the world. They are exposed. Philip, for instance, was married to an Italian wife from a prominent Italian heritage. And they are ambitious, both politically and financially. Philip and Gideon control billions of dollars worth of their family's fortune. To prove themselves, they followed the three rules that every Klepo statesman has followed over time. Rule number one, obtain a bank, or many banks in this case. You will never hear that the Moe's are banking with equity or family bank, no. That is for you, Monanji. For instance, Gideon Moy has control and vested interest in Gyro Bank, First American Bank, and Equatorial Banks. This allows them to bypass normal banking procedures like KYC, Know Your Customer, and allows the movement of money from the local banks to offshore accounts in tax haven jurisdictions. The ownership of the banks had started earlier with Moyan Biwat and would be a common trick that all the perpetrators in this web of deceit will use. Moy and Biwot co-owned four banks. That was drone nominees and proxy directors like the trusted Kanyotu and the loyal Kulei. There was the Middle East Bank, 
from Pan African Bank, Trade Bank, and since they were in an elite club, they also owned Bank Belogais, a bank in Belgium. Rule number two, obtain services of world-class money launderers. This is a no-brainer if you wish to be in the class of the top 1% of who owns the world. And not to sound opinionated towards the Indians, but it's their names that will feature prominently in this category. Rule number three, give government contracts to crooks. Here, crooks could be international business magnates or local tribal loyalists. And this is the most important part. For every contract, there must be a hefty kickback. Hefty enough for the president and crumbs to those seated at his table. And it is under rule number two that we unveil the face of a figure renowned across the globe, celebrated by critics and feared as the harbinger of illicit wealth transformation. The Moi dynasty sought only the best, and in their quest, they summoned Gabriel Musa Katri, a Swiss Israel virtuoso in the enigmatic art of concealing riches within offshore sanctuaries, creating phantom enterprises and orchestrating the clandestine dance of money from the Kenyan taxpayers to the private accounts of the Moise. But the Moise were not alone in the alliance with this notorious maestro. For other African despots, like the insidious Sunny Abbot of Nigeria, who stole over $2 billion worth of Nigerians' money, sought Katri's expertise. Musa Katri was able to make the ill-gotten billions vanish from their countries like shadows in the night. Katri wove a tapestry of complexity that defied conventional scrutiny. Instead of brazenly dispatching these riches to foreign accounts, he charted a clever course through the labyrinth pathways of Kenyan banking. Among the institutions in his networks, the Transnational Bank, an establishment already owned by the perpetrators. At Transnational Bank, Katri forged an unholy alliance with Ashok Gohil, the vigilant sentinel of Kulei's financial empire, who was strategically placed for this purpose. They created layering companies in Kenya, Asho Limited, Chan Limited, and another company known as Government of Kenya. Their puppeteers none other than Moi's legal concierge, Mutula Kilonzo, who served as the appointed director, weaving the final strands of these treacherous web. Through the obscure conduits of these banks, Nostro account, the tainted treasure flowed like a subterranean river, destined for eventual dispersal among multiple financial citadels, including the UBP. In his book, Moneyland, author Oliver Baller says, simply put, money is stolen from poor and unstable countries, then laundered in offshore jurisdictions and spent in a small number of wealthy, stable countries. According to Oxfam, the top 1% of the population controls 46% of the world's wealth. In other words, the richest 80 million people in the world own the same amount of stuff as the other 7.9 billion people in the world. This is a result of, among other things, hiding a country's money in offshore tax havens. That is how it is possible to have a property in London without having your name in the list of its owners or have a bank account in Jersey, which no one except you and your dealer knows about. This way, so much money leaves a developing country like Kenya and is spent in secret jurisdictions. In these jurisdictions, the perpetrators avoid taxes and legal records from the country of the source. 
And like everyone else, I have always wondered why the corrupt can't be forced to return what they have stolen. But the answer is simple. Expert money launderers use a complex layering comprised of legal and financial systems to hide this wealth. In other words, even if you wanted to, you wouldn't find it. And even if you found it, you wouldn't be able to legally prove ownership. The Moyes owned property and secret accounts in all known tax havens. The Caymans, Jersey, Luxembourg, Dubai, United Kingdom, and in Switzerland, are the most prestigious private bank and wealth management firm, Union Bancaire Privé, UBP. Once these substantial sums reached UBP, flowing into accounts under country's control, they raised no suspicions. Banking regulations typically don't mandate extensive due diligence for nostril accounts, unless queries arise from the originating bank. But Catri cleverly never appeared as a signatory. Instead, small-scale lawyers and businessmen were used uh, for that purpose. Catri exploited his position to persuade portfolio managers to handle questionable funds directly. He oversaw multiple accounts at UBP and other Swiss banks linked to the Arbiters and the Moise. We have already dealt with the cogs who made this fortune swell over the years. Moise's personal assistant and loyalist, Joshua Kule. Moise, lesser equal and the hand of the king. Nicholas B. Watt, Moise, Ailes and Sons, Gideon and Philip, and Moise, Money Mover and Schema, Musa, Katri. Now let's look at other prominent people who are mentioned. Zivi was an Israeli who immigrated into Kenya from Uganda around 1974. He introduced himself to Moy and Biwot, and he introduced to Moy and Biwot the likes of Alul Kassam, a banker, and Baisman Arahoni, a state capture operative. He was and still is a civil engineer with vast experience in construction. He taught Moy and Biwot what they needed to know about the construction business. In 1978, HZ Construction and Engineering Company was created by Zevi, Biwot, and Moy. HZ is credited for most construction projects from uh, when it was incorporated up to now. But for the purpose of this podcast, the company constructed the iconic Takwell Gojizan Kerio Valley and the less iconic but nonetheless famous Yaya Center. In 1986, Moy was the president and had hard grip on all the instruments of power. Biwot was a powerful minister, Minister of Energy. He was also a member of the Togan Boys Club, an influence on power dynamics. With that aligned, Biwot arranged for Zevi to get the contract to construct the Takwell Gorge Dam in Kerio Valley through the company that they had created, HZ Construction Company. The original cost of the contract was between 70 to 80 million US dollars, but as per rule number three of kleptocrats, the project had to be overstated. Its cost reached to 270 million US dollars. A whole $200 million profit for Biwot, Moi, and Gadzevi. 
$200 million in the 1980s. And where was the money laundered, you ask? Remember rule number one, obtain a bank. Lunul Kassam was ready with Trade Bank. Trump's National Bank was also ready. And they had a young man to set up a foreign currency account with international banks for purpose of laundering. Fun fact, the money laundered from 1986 to 1990 was so much that a young man who was 27 in 1990 was able to skim off close to $1 million without either Moy or Biwot knowing it. The young man, Solomon Mudamia, would later use the money to start his own bank in 1993, Eurobank. Picture this. Out of 260 state corporations or parastatals, only four are profitable. Only Kenya Ports Authority, Kenya Pipeline, Kenya Airports, and Kenjan are profitable. The others are either making losses year in, year out, like KPLC and Kenya Airways, or are on their deathbed if not already collapsed. But how is this Moi's fault? <laughs> Moy embarks on the gradual collegianization of the public and private sectors from the 1980s. Moy is a Tugin, one of the smallest Kalijan ethnic groups. He began to de Kikuyunize the civil service and the state owned enterprises previously dominated by the Kikuyu ethnic group during Kenyatta's regime. So he appointed Kalijins in key posts, in among others, the Agricultural Development Corporation, the Kenya Commercial Bank, the Kenya Post uh, Authority, the Kenya Post and Telecommunications, the Central Bank of Kenya, the Kenya Industrial Estates, National Series and Produce Board, and all other state corporations. And since the appointments were on tribal and not intellectual basis, most of these state-owned corporations were fleeced to their deathbeds. The case of Kenya Airways and Kenya Power have been covered in previous episodes. Please check them out. But in an ironic turn of events, the CEO who helped flee KPLC from 1983 to 2002 was a Kikuyu, one Samuel Gishoru. During Gishoru's tenure, the ministers for energy were one Nicholas Biwot and later Christana Zokemo. Kroll uncovered a business in the name of Government of Kenya, the directors of which were named as Moi, Sitoti, Okemo, Biwot, among others. This is literally true to the statement that Kenya is a company and it has shareholders. So it was like a noise. They had several ways to fleece KPLC. One, Gishoro would initiate a feasibility study on a potential power generation project. The feasibility study would be conducted at a cost of around $2.7 million. And between 1991 and 1993, for instance, Gishore initiated 14 such feasibility studies, but now one project was done. And the cohort, they pocketed the money. There was the Ewasongiro power dam that was supposed to have been constructed at a cost of $350 million. The money was paid out, but no project was carried out. And in 1997, Kenya started what has now become a pocket So, for every electricity user in Kenya. The IPPs, Independent Power Producing Companies. These companies are cartels owned by the prominent politicians and sell power to KPLC at a premium to the profit of the government of Kenya, not the country, but the company. An analysis by the Auditor General in June 2023 revealed that it costs KPLC an average of 3 shillings and 93 cents per kilowatt hours of power purchase from Kenjin, while it costs KPLC an average of 11.87 shillings per kilowatt hours if they buy the power from the independent power producers. In other words, Kenjin provides triple Jadamol power 
and KPLC has access to even cheaper hydro power. But KPLC instead buys power from IPPs at 200% more. Ibera Africa and Westmont Limited were the first IPPs. Guess the owners. Samuel Gishoru, Mohesh Gohil, a front for Moyan Biwot, Kamlesh Patni, and others. In total, Gishoru helped the system steal 20 billion shillings from the Kenyan taxpayer. And they're still doing it today. It is well documented that in South Africa, the former president, Jacob Zuma, fleeced his country billions of dollars with the help of the Gupta brothers. The Indian brothers who masterminded a full state capture. This brings to fore the question, is it that the Indians are intelligent scammers with a charm that can't be resisted? Or is it that African leaders are always looking for people that can help them still? Look at this list of Indians that the Moys used as masterminds. Mukesh Gohil, a nation from Kitale. He specialized in textile imports and exports, was also in the real estate. It has been reported that Gideon has two properties in London held under a trust set up by Mukesh Kohel. The Kroll investigators uncovered up to eight properties in the UK under his name. He is also a director of four questionable companies in both UK and Australia. Mr. Habidal Singh Sethi. He is a close associate to Mr. Nicholas Biwat and the Moyes and had a monopoly of contracts issued by the Ministry of Energy. He is a Kenyan occupation architect and a contractor, uh, currently a resident in Santon, Johannesburg. He moved to Johannesburg in 1997, and it has been reported that the Moyes have accounts held in South Africa and Malawi. And Sevi, the frontman for the Moyes, holds 74 properties in South Africa on their behalf. Mr. Ketan Somaya, he was well known to Joshua Kulei. He was the president's smokescreen. He controlled Equatorial Bank. Somaya in 1990 was contracted by the Kenyan government to import 500 look-alike those black taxi cabs for, from London. The cabs were worth 112 million Kenya shillings then. But Somaya delivered only 200 second hand vehicles, pocketing the rest of the money. In the mid 1990s, Somaya obtained 375 million Kenya shillings from the Kenyan government to supply communication equipment to the National Police Service. But he didn't. He skipped four separate summons by parliament to explain himself and fled to London to evade arrest. But good news, he was arrested elsewhere and charged and found guilty and jailed, but not on crimes concerning Kenya. Naushad Nurali Merali listed by Forbes as the richest man in Kenya and had interest in almost all the sectors. Some of the companies he owned were in conjunction with the Moyes, Biwot and the Kenyatas, like Kensel, the First American Bank, Commercial Bank of Africa, the Wilson Airport. He's also a seasoned tenderpreneur who got the contract to supply the government with the hats to trucks. He or they made a lot of money from that. Then there was Kamlesh Patni, brother Paul. Patni entered the fold in the 90s. To understand the technological background of the Golden Bug scandal of 1991-1993, watch the video above. But even without going to those details, 
Kamlesh Patni was the architect of the most blatant theft of public money by a sitting president. See, the 1992 election was approaching. Moi needed campaign funds and money to oil his propaganda and intimidation machineries. He needed money to finance the likes of Kano Yudwing of 92. But let's hear it from Kamlesh himself. Then I've been to nearly 80% of Africa. We had embargo on the country in 89, 90. It was dictatorship that time. Mm. It was single party. President Moy. Arak Moy. I was just 24 years old. I was buying a suit in Nairobi and I met the director of intelligence. Uh, then I told him about gold. I said, look, there's so much gold flowing through Kenya, but it's nothing Kenya is benefiting, it's not yeah. I said, well, I can create the 500 million, you know, every year from this, if you do a proper license of, of this gold. So he took me to president. Said, yeah, wow. So I, I became advisor to the president, President Moy. So then he gave, uh, you know, exclusivity. Patney's company, Goldenberg International, is granted an exclusive license to export Kenyan gold. Instead, gold from what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo is smuggled into Kenya. He sells it abroad and receives a 35% commission from the government. In total, Patney pockets $600 million. It's shared with Arab Moy and the government officials who gave him the license. The biggest beneficiaries of the money was Mr. Moy, of course. From the testimonies at the Bosira report, Moy's personal assistant, Shokulei, was adversely mentioned as having received large sums of money. Mr. Biwot's firm, Hitstead Construction Limited, also received large sums of money, 600 million. Kamlesh himself indicated that he gave Kulei loads of money and vehicles for the 1992 campaign. A CBK official called Mumelo testified against Joshua Kule, stating that he, Kule, telephoned him, Mumelo, at CBK with a threat. Joshua Kule asked Mumelo to stop investigating Transnational Bank, in which they were shareholders, for monies concerning the Golden Bug scandal. Mumelo would later die mysteriously. A Congolese musician, Bikasi Mandeko Bigos, testified that he was contracted by Kulei to compose songs in praise of Moi in 1992. He verified to the commission that Kulei was the Kanu campaign money bug. This clique managed to steal 158 billion of Kenyans' money. That is according to the Bosira report. The last phase that we must reveal is that of Professor Joyce Aitoti. This one scandal, the Golden Bug, tainted the image of a man widely respected for his genius and gentlemanship, a professor of mathematics and, and development thinker. Saitoti had more talent on his pinky finger than the rest of Moe's cabinet combined. But how he bent over to allow the Golden Bug scandal to take off is beyond me. The Bosire Commission found out that his actions were both deliberate and calculated. How does a Minister for Finance and Vice President give monopoly rights to a gold exporting company plus a 35% export compensation? Well, he knew too well that Kenya has never had any gold reserves. Saitoti knew it was all fake from inception. Saitoti, with all his intelligence, ignored warnings from ministry officials in supported Kamlesh Patni and the Golden Company. But as you can tell, it was all to please his master, Moy. Fun fact. 
By the end of the Golden Bug scandal, Setoti's name and image were so tainted that he'd live with that scar for the rest of his life. It was Mutavadi who was appointed to succeed Setoti at the helm of the Ministry of Finance in 1993. Mudavadi, young, 33 at the time, and promising, had just presented the 1993-1994 budget when he went to Parliament the next day for debating. It was Orengo's turn on the floor. As accolades poured forth upon the young luminary, um, today's Prime Cabinet Minister, the fiery Ugenya MP then, James Orengo, discerned a disquieting image. Amidst the adulation, Orengo's gaze fell upon the disconcerting sight of Mudavadi, the man of the hour. Mutavadi was seated between the imposing figures of Saitoti and the diminutive but indomitable Nicholas Biwat. This was the moment when Total Man, as he had been christened, stood revered within the fortress of Kanu and cast as a paria by the possession. Orengo, in his signature audacious manner, Albert delivered with a command of oratory that could move mountains, extolled Modavadi's virtues. Yet, in the crescendo of his praise, Orengo proffered a final counsel, one laden with metaphorical weight. You are a fine and untainted man. You will go far, but only, only if you stop sitting between two hyenas. Stung by the analogy, Biwot and Saitoti leaped to their feet, invoking a point of order in a temperature's display of emotion. Moi lived a peaceful and happy life after retiring in 2002. No one in this web of shame was ever convicted of corruption, at least not in Kenya. Moi passed away on February 4, 2020, leaving a vast amount of wealth that neither we, nor Forbes, nor anyone can quantify. For the next few minutes, as you go through the list of things owned by the Moyes, ponder to think, how far in development could the country be if these atrocities were never committed? I have no more words, just pure wonder and more motifs. As always, we unveil captivating tales of physical intrigue, where shadows dance with wealth, a clandestine league. The epic saga unfolds, a poetic tipstery they weave, interesting financial crimes, secrets they never leave. But I will be constantly yours. Jeff Kafka. <laughs>